All right, so we're live. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, today in the NOS DST meeting, we're going to talk about a couple of things. First of all, um, uh, the Huawei team is going to share with us some SDN uh, benchmark testing uh, proposal and, and some numbers too, also, right? Some reports. Yes. Uh, that's going to be the first 30 minutes. And then uh, the second uh, 30 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing uh, our plan to host uh, ONOS applications, at least some of the major ONOS applications in separate repositories. So, Jin, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, uh, Jin's going to take over and is going to present on the SDM benchmark testing plan. Right. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, we are Huawei here, and uh, we are actually proposing this uh, SDN benchmark testing plan. Uh, this is great. Okay, can, can you guys hear okay? Uh, Brian, can you hear us okay? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. It's good? Okay. I see. So during the last uh, two months, uh, I believe, uh, we have encountered uh, several uh, testing reports uh, from different areas. Uh, uh, like, uh, for example, IETF, uh, ONF, <clears throat> and they have all published their own uh, report and the testing guidelines. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is our uh, like procedure today for uh, some uh, contents there. So uh, first is that I would like to introduce like uh, some timeline about what recently happened with the SDN testing part. Uh, first is that in the November 2015, uh, ONF have published uh, their own uh, like uh, open flow controller benchmarking uh, reports. And uh, as you can see in the, in the list, it's all their, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, it's all their uh, testing case, and uh, uh, I won't take, <laughs> I, I won't go too detail about this part. But as you can see, uh, all the testing part is uh, based on the OpenFlow's uh, functionality, and uh, uh, for example, like uh, channel capacity, uh, which is about like how the controller can. Uh, Hold other other devices, and uh, other outstanding part is like uh, flow setup rate. Uh, oh, they divide that to the proactive and the, the reactive mode. And uh, if anyone is like interested, they have a paper there. So uh, maybe later we can post the link there. Like that. And. Uh, in the March 2016, Open Daylight, uh, they have published and also a performance report. Um, they actually published that twice. Uh, first is in March, and the second one is in the May for some update and uh, correct correction. Um, their testing case is more, uh, yeah, it's more uh, in the different it's a it's a contain different uh, protocols like OpenFlow, uh, NetConf, and uh, OVSDP, BGP, and the PCEP. And uh, on the right part, as you can see, this setup is uh, is their setup for the OpenFlow. And I know uh, because they do some uh, comparisons data uh, at this part, so um, uh, make it uh, getting a lot of attention, I believe. Um, and uh, also, I want to briefly introduce is that actually Open Daylight is also planning for a second version, uh, which will happen in this this year September, uh, with their new release of the Open Daylight uh, version. And uh, on OpenFlow's part, it's basically the same. Uh, so they are simplify some other protocols uh, uh, testing uh, cases. And uh, because as you can see from the first first one here, uh, like they are using like NetConf and uh, BGP, uh, this 
in this test scenario, they are all using their own uh, private private test tool, and uh, we have tried to uh, reproduce this procedure, but uh, we found that this uh, some of the test tool is pretty hard to find, or if we find it, we cannot download it. So uh, maybe some barrier there. So uh, they give up because they try to let their test case more open and. Uh, so other people can reproduce it and uh, see uh, to verify it. And um, more interestingly is two parts. First is that they're going to try to uh, test test the controller's performance in the uh, VTN uh, VTN function, like uh, in OpenStack, uh, which is like uh, it's a the big part there, and they are they are preparing like uh, as I know right now they are preparing some uh, a lot of OpenStack node there and uh, to orchestrate how they want to test it. Uh, but it's still in plan, but it's will happen in September. Uh, yeah. Also, like last time they say they won't do uh, the ODL's plan. Uh, in their performance report, they say that they only do the single node testing part, and uh, right now they are actually uh, trying to do the clustering test. So uh, this is also a new thing for them. So we'll stay tuned to it. Um, yeah. Oh, in second uh, in the their second version of planning, uh, two things. It's also pretty important is that first is that all tests will be automated and uh, they are they are trying to monitoring the JVM usage like CPU and brands usage so uh, that might be another um, variables while we are testing the controllers performance <clears throat> and uh, here is the IETF they have a benchmarking methodology which published in uh, July 2016. Uh, in this uh, methodology papers, uh, there's no actual like testing case they have, but uh, they are more like showing people uh, what they think about while well, testing a SDN controller, what, what part of the uh, things uh, we should be careful about, and uh, they are actually using a uh, open flows protocol as uh, uh, example. But, uh, they haven't mentioned the other protocols there, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Like you can see here, they divided into four parts: performance, scalability, security, and the reliability. I mean, the security part is uh, less people is like. Uh, take effort on this. Uh, the last one here is uh, is from a Chinese Chinese uh, SDN controller development group. I believe uh, it's called SDN CTC. And actually, I have an English version of this report here. Uh, thanks to Yo, uh, Wang Yo here. Uh, we have some talk there. And uh, actually, their uh, testing case, as we we read, uh, we read it, uh, we found that it's basically based on the IETF's uh, methodology there. And um, they have testing uh, the following testing case in the single node and the uh, clustering nodes uh, on the almost uh, open flows performance. I know, like that. And uh, this is our observation of the testing reports we have seen right now. Um, so here's some conclusion. Uh, performance tests should test through the southbound protocols uh, uh, more than just uh, open flow. And uh, we're going to test it uh, through the northbound API and uh, basically basically under the same circumstances and uh, we try to bring it more reality uh, besides just 
doing some uh, extreme parts. And uh, uh, the second part is that the recent test standard that most of the test reports focus on the uh, open flow uh, controls benchmarking, but uh, cannot completely reflect uh, SDN controller's ability, uh, like what we see in I IETF and uh, the SDN CTC uh, China's uh, things. Like because uh, IETF, they have uh, used the uh, OpenFlow as an example, so you can see how quick those group is like uh, reacting to this and uh, just quickly they produce some uh, testing case and uh, so you can see like how this test report is like uh, effect, uh, affecting this test test areas so uh, yeah so third thing is uh, just continue with the second part is that uh, we cannot just test open flows protocol and uh, it shouldn't be the only uh, definition for its uh, performance. And uh, also, uh, clustering performance is also a very important part. That's what the force point talking about. And uh, comparing it with the uh, single node version uh, environment uh, will be a very good uh, testing. Yeah, so uh, and the other, another part is that uh, uh, we want to we want to see uh, see if there is a more testing case we can we can try in the operation part uh, like a WAN uh, data center network and uh, this kind of thing. So uh, it might be have more uh, ability to prove the SDN controllers. Uh, reality, reality, and the true value. I mean, you can say like that. And then you can see, like from this five, is the <clears throat> major category of like uh, what you're testing it, uh, what it will be. And uh, later I will like present that. And uh, this is a summary. We find that uh, I think it's a it's a it's a like a category like how. Recently, this testing uh, cases and the testing tool is doing. Uh, basically, we have four here, as we can see. Like Owen Lab, we have the test on, uh, and uh, ODL o ODL's report. They have a set of the testing script written in Python too, uh, and also there is the Ixia and the Spiron. They are uh, they have like a Emula, emu, emulation, emulation tools to uh, emulate uh, different protocols devices. Uh, so uh, basically, right now, as we can see, there's an application on top of the controller, and uh, there's a device emulators under the controllers. So uh, basically, a lot of people is doing like this, like uh, like Tesson and uh, uh, OTL is like uh, they build up an uh, application on top of the controller um, so they can test like uh, through controller's uh, API, uh, Northbound API. And uh, to uh, and also, uh, also we categorize it as uh, software testing. And uh, on the bottom of it, it's like uh, we use uh, like ECIA and the Spiron to emu uh, emulate a uh, large number of the device to test like uh, controllers uh, session capacity and uh, uh, also controllers like uh, in clustering environment we test its uh, high availability uh, things like that we call it a networking test um, yeah so basically we can see this part Oh, actually, HA should be here at the lower button. But this is it. So our current job here, uh, current what we have done is that uh, first is that we uh, duplicate open daylight, uh, open flow, uh, northbound and southbound test case, and uh, 
we have confirmed that all nodes have some uh, better uh, performance in the single node environment. Uh, uh, basically, that is the same as the what we have in their update version of the report, uh, which is the same. And uh, we are using uh, Ixia and Aspirants to uh, test controller's <coughs> capability and the capacity in the one, uh, three, five, seven nodes uh, environment. And also, we are using a SOAP UI to uh, test the controller's VTNs uh, interface performance. <coughs> <coughs> and I did, uh, here you see is that uh, I have some, uh, I have some uh, uh, graph exp explanation of uh, how OpenDaylight uh, is testing on the OpenFlow no response. And the first, uh, as you can see, they have the application on top, controller, and they are using mini that to uh, uh, emulate emulate those uh, open flow devices and uh, basically is that uh, yeah checking they are sending sending the ad flows uh, rest api to the controllers and uh, they are basically monitoring monitoring this time and then uh, they also uh, so later they after after you sending this uh, ad flows rest message, uh, they will go back to check uh, what's the status on the controller. So uh, this is the two times uh, they are measuring, same as the uh, while they are removing the flows. Uh, besides this, uh, pure uh, rest APIs uh, operation, they also having a script to directly. Uh, checking the meaning that uh, status so as a, as a reference here so uh, this is our uh, data here as you can see this is like a one flow add controller uh, yeah add, adding one flow per rest message and this is like a 200 flows adding and uh, this is one flow removing, and uh, this is uh, 200 flows removing. Yeah, the yellow light is uh, ODL, and the blue line is the uh, ONOS. And the, the uh, Y axis is for the time, so uh, the lower the better. So as you can see, yeah, basically in general, in general, ONOS is doing better. And uh, especially when the switch number is going up, uh, ODL is like uh, ODL's time is growing, rising pretty sharply, uh, sharply, and um, that's a good thing. And uh, we verify that uh, with their update version of the report. Uh, the, the data train is basically the same. So uh, yeah, we can talk more maybe later <laughs> in that part. And also, yeah, uh, we try to monitoring it. Uh, uh, CPU on the left and uh, memory usage on the right as you can see yeah the, the yellow one is the ODLs one and the, the blue one barely a blue one is the ONOS here and uh, one thing we need to be very atten pay attention to is like we are using an OBS 2.4.0 version here and uh, so actually we bring this uh, data to Open Daylight 2 and they are telling me that uh, because Open Daylight, that, the version they are using in their report for that version of the OBS, uh, they are not very, how say, uh, they haven't designed for it. Like they have some bug in the OBS 2.4.0 version. So that's why, uh, as we can see the data is going pretty high. And uh, I think this is a very good example to say why we need to have some uh, unified testing uh, plan together. Because uh, like what, what, we, what we do here is like we are using, like for example, we are using OBS 2.4.0. And uh, we have some uh, very strange uh, data there showing that ODL is like uh, running pretty dramatically higher in the percentage of the CPU usage or memory usage, then uh, yes, and then ODL will jump out say like, hey, uh, you shouldn't use like 
OBS 2.4 version uh, because we didn't support that yet. And uh, because it's lacking of the information, so uh, that makes every, yeah. What is it that they don't support in OBS 2.4? Uh, they have the open flow table feature, I think. Inside, the, inside. The table feature has some bugs. Uh, they cannot handle that properly. That's why they see the big yeah. issues. The so they almost step back to use the old version. The previous version of OBS have the table feature as well. Uh, I think they are suggesting mm. me to use like 2.2 .2 version. No, the OBS already support that, but the, their their ODR drivers have some problems. Cannot take care of the table features properly. That's why they want to step back to the old versions. So the old the report they published was based on the old version, OVS, OVS old version instead of the new one. So so the that's why we tried the, in the in the labs and say hey we use a new one. We feel we see the big difference. <laughs> when you add a flow, are you adding it in a specific table or are you adding it just? Table uh, just gen generally. So the table features aren't even involved. No, the, the ODR the implementation, we don't know, right? So the, based on the feedback we talk about this one so with the ODR guys, they will say, hey, we, 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 we use this the table features to uh, install the flow through some case, you say, okay, <laughs> we step back. Here is the information we got from the ODR uh, benchmarking team. Oops. Yeah, so um, that's it. Well, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, different people, uh, different group. They have uh, different um, because they, they have different information than that. So, uh, like like this time, because we talked to ODL, then uh, so they can give us this information. So it's like, yeah, we shouldn't using this uh, version of the OBS. Uh, yeah, things so um, like this. So the memory here is measured clearly from an external standpoint, so that you're just seeing basically the heat and the, the whole um, memory footprint of the overall machine, right? Yeah, overall machine. Yeah. So the fact that it flattens out seems like maybe the so is the JDM run with uh, with what option? Uh, actually, uh, option is like uh, like eight gigs. Right? Eight gigs. Yeah. Okay, that would explain why. Okay. Yeah, that's why it's uh, maxed out here. Yeah. So basically, I, I just uh, monitoring the PS to check the Java Java. Uh, I mean, I know that this is not part of the scope of this test, but it would be interesting to see if we uh, uh, ran uh, either of the controllers with more headroom, yeah, and see what happens because there should be no, you know, the, the, there should be some natural stabilization. Uh, if mm. there's no memory leaks, the, the JVM should find some plateau mm. that's determined by the workload. Right, and and we should see similar, but probably not as nice uh, flattening. This seems to me like we hit some sort yeah. of cap. I mean, that uh, is and, like uh, a, it's so we don't know whether there's a leak or not. Right, it seem, seems like. I mean, this it's would be the high water mark, right? I mean, uh, it looks like they're measuring it from the outside. If you're measuring yeah. the utilization, that would give you a better sense of like you know how the uh, how the utilization of the heat is very. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you're right. Right. So. And this is just running the controller or doing things to the controller? Uh, what do you mean? Like uh, we are? Oh, this is like uh, when we testing testing the the test case we previously about. Okay. Just so so we don't we don't see the set of the, the, the test progression against this timeline. Would yeah. be interesting to okay, see. So exactly. But here you're installing yeah. flows yeah. and doing stuff. Yeah, first it's like it started <coughs> yeah. uh, uh, from here. The adding part is like it started, so uh, it's bump up a little bit then. Uh, after it's stabilized, it will go like here. Then we add the flow to it. It will go up a little bit. Then after that, it's going back. Okay. I guess like that. Then removing is like uh, me removing it. Go up. Stay there. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> this is a, yeah. this so, is a memory. Yeah. It's a memory. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's fine. So this is all. Uh, yeah. Any more? So uh, yeah, I haven't the other two part. I haven't bring the data yet because uh, it's they are they are doing that in the China team right now. Uh, the SOAP UI, uh, you know, it's uh, basically sending 
uh, RESTful, uh, RESTful request to a uh, controller and uh, they are using the SOAP UI here to test the VTN's performance there. And uh, uh, should be more here. And uh, the network creation, modification, query, deletion, uh, this thing. And uh, Spiron and Axia is uh, basically doing the same thing uh, here. We just testing on the controller's uh, southbound and uh, session capacity, uh, scalability, those things. Like uh, you see here, we are using uh, linear topology. See like uh, how many devices the controller can hold. Uh, also the security is like we adding, a, we, we, we trying to use the TLS connection and the complexity like group and the linear topology. Uh, I think host part is like the, uh, I, think, I think this part is our plan is that because Spiral and XCR, they can support the uh, uh, traffic traffic generating, and uh, we can just like sending, injecting the uh, traffic uh, from the bottom, and to see like, uh, for example, like pack it in, pack it out, uh, things. And uh, this is the protocols we are right now trying to uh, test on. Um, Okay, so uh, as you can see here, uh, we make some uh, categorize uh, what is uh, testing here. Uh, basically, it's on the northbound, we are testing like REST, uh, CLI, GUI, RPC, Young Shell. And the operation part, uh, we have like a data center, uh, SFC, L2, L3, UPN, and the Cloud VPN, this stuff. Uh, controller itself, we like, categorize it as the reliability. Like, uh, we have like high availability, uh, clustering, security, reliable, uh, consistency, sorry. Uh, and also, actually, there is a performance in the controller. And the southbound is like uh, basically it's about uh, extensibility, about like how many protocols it uh, support. Uh, basically, as you can see, the highlight one is the one we found, which is like uh, people are testing right now, and uh, the other one, I don't know, maybe maybe there's some uh, like here. I'm a little bit confused. I mean, confused yeah. <clears throat> There seems to be some mixing here. So clustering is a mechanism, which is just a mechanism. It's yeah. used to accomplish scalability, high availability, and, yeah. and also performance, right? Basically. Yeah. yeah. But it's a mechanism. So um, whether it either functions or it doesn't. So the thing that you want to test for uh. is scalability, high availability, or performance, right? The clustering yeah. is just a mechanism. So uh, um, that may be uh. a little bit misleading. So what, what parts of clustering are you testing? Is it the scalability part? Is it actually the uh, clustering part? Is like uh, like uh, we, if we have a master slaves relation, we just like kill one and see which one is master. This so kind you, of you that would that's be high low way. Way. Uh, I feel like right. yeah, that's high yeah. right? That's it. Yeah. yeah, kind of like mix here, but uh, yeah, I try to refine this categorize and so, um, uh, just for clarity, it might be better yeah, yeah. to. Be Somehow separate. Yeah, and also some there's overlap, right? Reliability and high availability. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is the one I want to uh, get better <laughs> on yeah. this category, but uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, the basic concept here is that I want to show is that uh, so there's a lot of blank here, blank space here. Uh, we are trying to fill and. Um, yeah, we are so so. This is how it looks like right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I will definitely refine it and uh, bring it back to it. Uh, well, here is a long one. So uh, uh, the last pages here, I want to uh, showing some uh, situations, current situation on the testing part, and uh, also our future plans and proposal, basically. 
Uh, first is that uh, I believe we have still ha uh, we, we still got some impact uh, from the Open Daylight's previous uh, performance report. Uh, I have to say uh, because uh, in March they are actually using the Ono's uh, one point five uh, RC two version uh, to test with uh, the complete version of the uh, Open Open Daylight and uh, giving a very bad uh, result to Onos and uh, eventually they made a modification and uh, updated it on, in May, uh, which is the data I've shown pre previously. Uh, actually, Onos might doing better. Uh, but when I like when I talk to people, especially uh, with some uh, China, uh, China teams there, uh, they still got the impression that from the March version of their ODS report that uh, uh, Ono's data is like looks worse than ODL. This is as expected and as intended. <laughs> intended? <laughs> not wow. the first bullet, right? Yeah. It's not an accident. Any... Ah, okay. <laughs> Speeches. Uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, but as I said, is that uh, we might want to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, uh, uh, participating in some sort of a standardized hmm. um, benchmark, yeah, which has uh, provides a meaningful common reference for evaluating the performance right. in a reasonably broad, con you know, reasonably full context, right? Because hmm. you can't con doing single controller, yeah, that's interesting, but not really mm -hmm. good enough because per exactly per because uh, uh, scalability and high availability can have negative impact on performance. And if you omit those things, or if you then then you then you're not seeing part of the picture. Right. Yep. So that'll that'll be um, very helpful, and hopefully we will reverse this uh, this uh, yeah this negative image. But yeah, uh, I think the couple of things that is uh, is uh, from from the previous uh, the slides was that was that so the based on the analysis on that full report and the internally when we talked to the some other guys they were thinking just to ta test the performance on the core of the S D controller is not the good enough so you need to verify your performance scalabilities all those things. Uh, the, 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 with the northbound protocols and uh, with the southbound protocol and the northbound the service. <clears throat> That's why we were thinking we should the, potentially the testing case should include the northbound the operations and the, all those things. Uh, here is the one suggestion to the performance uh, uh, benchmarking uh, from the Huawei side. Um, another thing is uh, it's uh, what the what the the set is the tools. Currently, we don't have the 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 real envi environment to verify the southbound. So the lot of uh, case that were using the emulators, BGP emulators, and uh, all these OSPF uh, emulators. So the so it seems like uh, need the common emulators to verify test uh, each uh, controllers. Potentially, we could the. Uh, uh, use some open source or some uh, testing emulators to to do the to set up the, the benchmarking uh, environment i think uh, that is a two key point we're trying yeah. to uh, bring to the teams right 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 yeah. uh let me bring it back yeah so uh yeah first is that uh so since patrick bring it out is that uh we found that it's pretty hard to uh find those emulators and uh yeah, I mean, like uh, on the on the application part, it's like pretty hands on. We uh, we actually agree that uh, test on is a pretty it's a very good uh, test framework to practice on. Mm -hmm. But on the lower part, the device part, uh, yeah, it's pretty hard to find some uh, emulations uh, on different uh, protocols. And uh, so uh, I think it's pretty well is that if we raise these issues and. Uh, so maybe the community can get more resource uh, or people when maybe some people is doing that but they don't get attention to it so uh, 
but right now if we proposing that so uh, maybe they are they can notice that and say hey we got we got the tool you want so maybe we can like work together on that on that part um something like that so uh yeah another another difficulty we found is that uh so uh, we are all doing the uh, like like we are all doing the onos for for time for time uh, for days or months or years I don't know. Uh, so but uh, yeah so when we doing the Ixia and Aspirants uh, testing um, there uh, that thing is that so we we try to compare onos and ODL but uh, on the ODL part uh, some of the Function like how do, how we activate some uh, some of their plugin those things, it's pretty hard. Uh, we have to search online and uh, some of their document is like outdated or something. So uh, it's pretty 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 much a nightmare <laughs> that part. So uh, yeah, so uh, maybe I think I mean we can what we can do is that we can write uh, some documentation that uh, to telling people yeah this is the right. Uh, Right procedure to 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 operate the test and uh, so is that so yeah. we're a little bit past that, time here. Oh, so in, okay. uh, in terms of you have this, you mentioned this was your last slide. Yeah, this is okay. the last slide. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So you guys mm. plan to work on starting just to, to your last point? You planning? Are you planning mm. to sort of bootstrap some sort of a common framework for testing performance, and scalability, and, or the controller as a whole, or yeah. Is that what I understand? Uh, can you repeat that? <laughs> so, do, do I understand uh, correctly that, that yeah. you're trying to bootstrap some community? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Effort? Okay. Right, right, right. So, um, some effort that so we can, uh, first is that uh, we can gathering resource. Uh, second is that we can have some, uh, we, we can have some, uh, because like if one institution, they have their own testing method, it so might not be like, might not be approved or agreed by the other institutions. Sure. So, sure. yeah, by by communicating, we, we we can like say like, hey, we we all agree on this method. So, uh, what is testing data out? And uh, because actually, people are seeking for this data mm -hmm. right now. And uh, if one institution using their own opinions to test on one controller, those things, uh, I don't know the feature is like. If it's good luck, we may have some uh, good things. But uh, so this thing is like uh, we want to make it under control, uh, okay. things like that. So uh, yeah, um, I think that's the point. Uh, another thing, uh, just a brief here is the CPERF. It's a it's what yeah, we found. Really quick because we're oh, okay. running short sure. on time. Yeah. So, so, so if you, I, th I thought you already covered the CPER, right? It's the open NFV <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it's open NFV stuff, and uh, you can check online. Uh, okay. On that part. So. Yeah, I think the quick summary. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, so the please. so the so the so the now is uh, we we already get the the more the uh, testing case. But we haven't got the, the drive to the, the, the data yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, soon we will uh, publish the, the other ones. Okay. So the so the from the testing methodology, uh, methodology point of view, we will uh, write up uh, the whole set of the testing case performance, scalability, all the things for the teams to re review that. So the, I we also hope the, the teams, the TST teams, uh, everyone's here to give us the feedback and uh, how to drive this. Uh, Test case of method of dot which is forward. So the that is uh, okay. We need the community's uh, feedback. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So thank you. I mean, we, yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. So with with that, we can we're gonna move to the other part of the talk here. Uh, <coughs> okay. Brian, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to make sure. Now, I don't have any slides or anything like that. This is going to be more of a free-form discussion. I just copied the contents of the original email in here. This is a sort of a summary. But the, the, the whole point here is to 
to figure, to discuss with whether or not it's a good idea um, to start separating some of the uh, ONOS applications, especially some of the more prominent or sizable ones, such as, uh, for example, the segment routing of vRouter, ACTN, and, um, and others, or, or NEMO, um, to, to their own repositories. And uh, this was actually um, something that was discussed internally, but I think it was put uh, um, into uh, sort of a overdrive mode by some of the recent submissions, uh, specifically the NEMO submissions. They're very, very sizable um, um, uh, code additions, and while it's useful functionality, it's something that's not necessarily integral to the core. Um, and so um, the, the point here is to, uh, to prevent the ONOS core repository from sort of growing in an unbounded fashion. And also to um, to give individual projects, especially in, during earlier in their life cycle, sort of more autonomy in how they um, how how they govern the the, the code check-in process. Now it's still the it would still be governed through Garrett and module owner programs, of course, but uh, the sets of uh, module owners uh, would be different for each project, and um, and so there would be more liberties that the project could take, especially during the incubation period. So is there any is there any objections to start separating some of the applications into separate repos? How much, how much of, uh, how far do you see this going? So, that's a good question. Um, I don't know yet. Um, I, I think there, there's still place for some of the applications, like the smaller ones and utility ones, to be part of the same ONOS code base. I mean, we could separate those two. I mean, that would be one extreme. We could eventually migrate all of the apps into their separate so I, things. I have some questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes, you do. Know yes. Uh, um, there's a tool that's actually designed for, for managing uh, it's really designed for managing OSs, mm -hmm. uh, OS repos, mm -hmm. uh, where different components are in different repos, and then you pull them in into kind of a unified uh, directory structure, mm -hmm. and uh, you can group things. So, for example, we could, I'm just saying things, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that we want to go down that route, but you can tag things as, say, like certain repos and say, this is the kernel part, mm -hmm. uh, this is a hardware scratching layer, this is a, I don't know, uh, drivers, mm -hmm. this is uh, apps, and uh, you can tag them. And when you check it out, you can say, I on, I'm only interested in the app section, so you only check out the apps and you build that. And it's, the tool is called Repo. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, it relies on, it doesn't change anything to your current, well, it doesn't change, change anything to your existing repos. Of course, you have to separate the repos yes. out into multiple uh -huh. gates, yes. but it doesn't change anything to them. And then it integrates straight into with Garrett. Okay. Um, and so it, it manages things nicely because when you make changes across multiple repos, um, you don't have to go to each individual repo and say um, and say uh, you know, get, uh, review or whatever. You don't have to go to the individual one. You just say repo upload, and it goes along and checks all the repos uh, that you have against the upstream and says, "Oh, this one's changed. Upload that one." Right? And then it creates reviews for you and does it all. It's all kind of. All together, and that's what we're we're moving towards that in court. In court. Um, I mean, maybe in court it makes more sense because we have clearly many more repos. Uh, but it's just a suggestion that sure. something you could look at. Uh, sure, I found it pretty nice. So, so, Ali, what's it called? It also allows people to um, to uh, when they pull in ONOS, say, yes, they can define their own manifest file that is based off our manifest file. Mm -hmm. Right, so like you just take a manifesto, extend it. Uh, we need like in the XML, we just extend it, and uh, and that. And so you just include the previous like the pointer to the previous manifest file, extend it, remove what you don't want, add what you want. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So people can autom like uh, themselves add what they need. So you essentially can create a sort of sparse project structures to bring onto your own into your own sandbox only the parts that you're interested in. Yeah. Building, yeah, and then you just build whatever you want to build. Now that puts responsibilities on us to make sure that all the components in the ONOS that are broken out mm -hmm. can build on their own. 
No, obviously, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Which yes. makes, I mean, it's not sure. the obvious, right? right. Uh, but, uh, but, but I found it, so far, I found it quite nice. And it doesn't impose anything on you. You can always move that structure around. So I have a question, but I think there was a question. Is that you, Brian, when you just asked something? Yeah, what, what was this tool called? Repo. Repo. Yeah. So my question is, um, so if you were to start by, let's say, just creating a couple of separate repositories, um, we, we can start there, right? Uh, and then we could investigate it uh, at the different pace, the use of the repo tool, right? So, so that, is that possible, or is that something that has to be available yeah, from the no, 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 no. You can, The manifest is an external file okay. that lives in its own repo, right? Okay. It lives in its own repository, yeah. I guess. Yes. Uh, and uh, and um, so so you you can add that whenever you want. I mean, actually, at this point, if you separate out the repo, anyone is free to create their own manifest file and do whatever the hell they want, right? Okay. Uh, it, it doesn't. It's not something you have to. Especially if you keep a set, if you don't change the current existing directory structure, mm -hmm. then all your build tools should just work the same way. Yeah. We have kind of this curse in core now where we're changing the directory structure, so it's it's a mess. Yeah, yeah. But. Uh, so, yeah, so my thought was that we would start by, uh, specifically probably start with the NEMO and potentially the ACGN first, because the segment routing and VRouter already have their home under us, and then probably in a second wave separate those whenever we're ready to do that. But but the idea was for setting up a separate repo for NEMO is to sort of unblock the initial check-in, because I don't, I don't, I don't want to put the initial check-in into ONOS if it's going to eventually go into a separate repository, because that would those entries would still exist in the history of the Onos repo unless we from that. Yeah, so the quick question the I was uh, concerned about this uh, dependencies and now the, the in the poem yes. uh, uh -huh. to specify after you separate the build mm -hmm. the two too many uh, separate things you need to specify the each one they were they, they have their own the version yes. number, yes, right? Correct. You you need specify in the palm. So, yes. so 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 the poten Do you think the potential they could make the palm palm the man version management and dependencies management too complicated? So I mean, it's a good question. So I would not. So the the, the there's a couple of parts to that question. So let me answer them. In, uh, let me answer it in parts. So by breaking things into separate pieces, uh, the the relationship between the different parts of ONOS will become very similar to the relationship of ONOS and third-party operating systems like, uh, not operating systems, third-party libraries like Guava, OpenFlow.j, and other things like that, right? They're basically just version numbers. And by decoupling them, it, it, create, it has some benefits, but of course it has some caveats. The, the benefits are that the, the different parts of the systems can now evolve and release at their own site uh, speed. The, the caveat comes in when uh, one needs to make a change to two parts, the different parts of the system, uh, sort of simultaneously. Because let's say you're developing a feature in component A, and then you need, to, which depends on component B, but then the component B has to have some sort of a design change done to it or evolution of the API that brings in the support, the necessary supporting functionality. And so this is where problem comes in. If you need to make the changes sort of sim quote unquote simultaneously to two different parts, then that that needs to happen by either depending on the snapshot version or by introducing some sort of a mild staggering. Uh, dependency on snapshot version causes number of issues because even if you do depend on a snapshot version, then the Gary verification builds may not necessarily have the visibility to correct snapshot to the latest snapshot, right? because snapshot is kind of a moving frontier. Release versions are checkpoints in time. And so my suggestion would be to avoid dependency on snapshots as much as possible, and continue to depend on a release versions among these, uh, these separate pieces. But to minimize the pain of, of, of uh, or minimize the need for snapshot dependency would be to start releasing things more often uh, by um, potentially even every sprint. And that's something that we talked about independently anyway. Uh, no, 
of course, since some of these things are applications, this now brings also more pressure on the one pending feature that we have in a backlog, which is to help support, have almost support versioned application dependencies. Right now, we, application A can depend on application B, but uh, the, which version it's unstated. Yeah. And we need to bring in the, the version coordinate, you know, version into the coordinate space. So that application A 1.2 can depend on application B 3.5 yeah. or more. So basically just sort of pro promote the, uh, the OSGI version system to the application space system. So, so the so the Ali the repo can handle this ones dependencies. Uh, it's not. It's, 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 it's independent. It's, it's not. Yeah. It's not its job. No. It's it's just it's the idea is for the repo tool if I understand it correctly is basically just to be able to allow tagging different parts of the system and, and allow you to bring in sparse project structure so you can build only the parts of the system that you want to work yeah, on. So it's got nothing to do with because it doesn't get involved in dependency. It doesn't get involved in your actual. Build system. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So one one comment here is that uh, your release cycle, your sense of autonomy and sense of ownership, is not necessarily coupled to the source control system. The source control system, I mean, one advantage of having the whole thing as one big repo is that you can make atomic commits and you get implicit versioning, like implicit versioning, version dependencies, i.e. code that's in the same commit depends on all other code that's in the same commit. Yes. So I, I think one thing that we should be careful of is that this problem of codependent modules or uh, like a series of cascading modules that depend on functionality in one project to be available in another one, to be on another one, like this is going to be a big pain in the ass. Um, and so, I, I just perhaps I, you know I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't do any of this, and I think we can we can do some of the stuff that you suggested. Um, but I guess my I'm not really sure here what problem exactly we're trying to solve, other than the fact that the repo is going to get bigger. What was the pain in the ass thing? Sorry, I, I missed that. Okay. So so dealing dealing with explicitly naming. Um, versions or version like version dependencies is going to be a big pain. Between between you. Yeah. So, so say you have say you have the segment routing application, right? In segment routing, we decide we want to, you know, add some add some feature to it that's going to require some new functionality that the core subsystem needs to make available. Yeah, or say we want to migrate the intent framework. Or the intent framework API, or make you. That's where. That's where the if. Well, again. Uh, yeah. So what you're saying is, if you have essentially, if you have multiple commits across multiple repositories. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you if you want to make a, a codependent or a change that has dependencies or that needs to, to, if you need to make a change that crosses multiple repos, mm -hmm. it's going to be a big problem. And so, if you want to expose functionality in one repo to another, mm -hmm. then the only effective way to do that is to 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 depend on a release version. I, I don't think yes. the snapshot option is a viable one. Well, which which is yeah. Well, agree. Also, also here, here's the thing. So, well, first making dependent uh, um, dependent uh, commits across. Repo boundaries. Um, the the repo tool will upload those okay as individual change sets in Garrett, but they'll be uploaded in in one shot. Right? Um, and then if how is that how is that uh, dependency on the I was going to get to what I was going to get to the dependency part. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so in Jenkins, if you define the build as a Maven project where the 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 build process looks for changes in uh, its dependencies and triggers build across. So it basically resolves all the dependencies and builds all the projects that have changed. Right. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's what we do in um, in in Cord again. Uh, we have one project which is a dependency of all the other projects. If you change that project, 
the the other projects get built again. Now, there may be an issue where all of those changes are pending, where it'll try to build against the latest version of that build. But I'm sure there's an option for that to to tell to figure out that like it needs a new version. So, yeah, maybe it doesn't totally resolve it, but it's somewhere along those lines. So. You may have, but, uh, but, I, but I think in general, I think we should strive towards what Brian said, dependency on release, right? And, 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 and minimize the need for this. Uh, I mean, that's fine. I mean, I guess the, 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 the applications that get pulled out, or things that get pulled out depend on the release. It's just that, like, um, that there's a significant change in behavior for people. Like people have been used to uh, developing against the bleeding edge of Windows, yes. and now they have to deal with three months. Yeah, well, so 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 maybe yeah. It, yeah, yeah you're I, right. I, I, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm just saying. So so. Yeah. So, um, so so I think the the way to solve that is to to make releases more often, right? Mm -hmm. And and not necessarily have like a one dot five go to one dot six, have one dot five, one dot five dot one, one dot five dot two, that kind of stuff, right? We don't want to have like a, you know, thirty minor versions. So you can have build versions, right? Like uh, yeah, well, minor, sorry. Um, the thing is, like, um, if you're if you don't work well on them and you've got an application right now, it usually doesn't work and it doesn't run in the source tree, right? Yeah. So, so if this is a pain in the ass, then it's a pain in the ass for everybody. I agree. It's, it's already a pain in the ass for us. Right? So we need to solve this problem. No, I agree. I agree. I, I, and I agree with the. the I think. I, yeah, I, I don't know that making more releases more often solves that problem. It, I think it makes there's less time between when you develop a feature in the core and when you can depend on it in your application. Yeah, but I think I think um, yeah, I, I don't know because that basically that means that like people have to keep it, like people who have apps that are outside of Windows have to know what the latest version is to refer to that latest version. What do you mean? No, they just have to pick the version that they that has the yeah, minimum yeah. requirements for them to run. And sure, move, but, move, but move I'm saying like, like if they're if they're always move if they're all, if if their development in the core yes. is always moving forward, they always have to update their version. Yes. So that's what snapshots are really there for. But like when you build, when you have a new, when you have a new change, you have a new snapshot that you have to go get. Yeah. Or yeah but the problem with snapshots, Ali, is that like snapshot doesn't mean anything. Snapshot, especially on a three-month project, means that the likelihood that you're like that someone's going to check something in that's going to break your build is is non-trivial. But 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 that's the same as well. I agree, but I mean that's the price you pay for developing against the bleeding edge. You can't well, have it both ways. Well, but the thing is, the thought was if we if you release or produce some sort of daily bill or even like let's say weekly builds or there there it's something that maybe is not a full on release, but it is a stable, not moving version. The problem with snapshots is that's a moving frontier, and it can introduce regressions or new functionality or potentially even. Um, breakages in API because it's a transient thing, right? Well, and so, so it shouldn't bring breakages. it shouldn't bring APIs. But uh, but the thing is, it's 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 a it's a it's a moving contract. It's not a finished pro product, and so some liberties can, are generally taken. So yeah. even though the a final yeah. version, it's really the same as if you're developing inside the source tree anyway, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, it's the same thing. Yes. But the thing is, when you're inside the source tree, you have the chance to sort of the react to it. You have more yeah. visibility yeah. by separating things. Uh, yeah, you have to sort of declare explicit, but de depending on a fixed point in time, uh, whether it's a release version or whether it's some sort of a official build yeah. number, um, it gives degrees of freedom to both parties in uh, sort of in this in this transaction. The, the people working on the dependency can uh, can move on with their life. Right, because they know they've left behind a stable checkpoint, and people working against the dependency know that they have a solid surface that they can lean on without things mutating mysteriously underneath them. And I think we should get to that mode of operation as quickly as possible. Whether it's using, you know, basically releases now, whether that's actually whether they're sort of snapshots which have a fixed uh, number. Uh, I mean, you can always. I mean, even if it's a snapshot, you can always point to a specific snapshot. That's the thing. Is well, the thing is, we I don't mean, currently do that. 
And so well, you do. So how, well, you, you can't really point to specific snapshots because well, they time out. You can, but it expires after a few days. That's the problem. Yeah. So actually, technically speaking, there's no such thing as a quote-unquote snapshot in a um, uh, what's it called? There's no such thing as a snapshot in a remote uh, wow. remote published repo. Well, what happens is it gets it gets a it gets a timestamp right. in lieu of snapshot, and then snapshot is just a pointer that's maintained for your convenience by the the metadata file. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is that you can you can ask to get a specific because uh, uh, it, it keeps all the times it keeps all the timestamp versions at least on the remote on the on the public it keeps it keeps them for for four or five days. Um, it keeps like the last three or or the, the timeout policy is, is dependent on the the repo. But yeah, it'll usually keep like three or four, maybe five, or you know maybe it'll phase out the fifth one after seven days or you know. So uh, yeah, maybe so, that, that's but, not but the most reliable thing. Yeah, but, but those are some tactical things you can probably figure out at a later time. But in term, so just to get a closure on the overall point. With starting with some of the, the major things like Nemo, ACT, and segment routing, and vRouter is a second phase. Um, is there any like really, really strong objections again against going with that? No. Is there a way to, in, in the dependency in the palm file, when you specify the dependency, say, on ONOS, to say, I want to depend on the latest ONOS? Um, so, because that's one way to get around that, right? Like you tell people, well, then also you're depending on a moving target. Well, yeah, yeah, you're depending on a moving target. I don't believe there is an expression for that. I mean, it would normally would be project or version, but that only makes sense if you're within that project scope. Yeah, because then you can. Well, I don't know. I'm just trying to see what. what, so, what I don't. Know. Um, the one other sort of comment maybe I'll, I'll make to close here uh, from my perspective is that um, I think we've taken a number of, of strides to help mitigate the, the downsides with um, a more monolithic repo. Uh, one is that uh, builds are a pain if you have to build everything in a, in a monolithic repo and so for that we've transitioned to Buck which will do um, which will only build stuff that's changed or stuff that you specifically care about or target or depend on. Um, we've also built a module owner program that gives, normally with a repo you can commit anywhere you want. With our module owner program we've restricted people's ability to, to commit to certain areas. And then another uh, you know, common criticism of big repos is the performance is bad, but if you look at companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of them run repos that are enormous, bigger than the Linux kernel, um, and they've they've either conquered the scale challenges or figured out how to deal with it. So, but the, one, they, use, they use tools like like repo to have multiple repositories. No, no, no. Like Facebook has a Facebook at least I know has a, a massive, massive repo. I think all of their mobile stuff is in one repo. Well, I mean, I don't know about Instagram, but on the flip side, Android is multiple repos. Multiple repos. Yeah, multiple repos. I, I agree with you there. And a lot of uh, you know, open daylights, multiple repos, and blah blah blah. So there's there's definitely been people that have tried to solve the big code challenge problem by having lots of little repos and pulling them together with orchestration tools like repo, which I haven't looked into yet. Um, but there's other people that have have solved um, this problem by just putting all their code in one basket and then having smarter build tools and releasing subsets of their their product um, on different cadences. So uh, I guess my I'm not convinced that this is going to solve our problem. Um, I think there may be a few things that get a little bit easier. Um, there's also going to be some new challenges that come in here. And so it, to me, like where the code sits, it just seems like we're kind of pushing it around. I mean, if there's, a, if there's a really good reason to get it out, I mean, I think in cases where projects are completely separate, I think Yang Tools is a good example of that. You know, Yang Tools is, you know, it's a compiler, uh, it's a parser, and it's a code generator, right? And it's, it's something that runs as part of the build process, not in line. Um, and so the changes there are, you know, not really related to Onos. Okay, it makes sense to split that out. 
Uh, STC, test framework, it makes sense for me to split that out. Something like an application uh, for which there may be there may be dependencies on API changes and stuff in, in the code base. Um, I, I just, I'm not as, it's not as compelling an argument to me to, to pull that out, especially because now you're going to have to deal with when a developer wants to make co core changes, they're going to have they're going to have issues when they're trying to figure out how to. Um, and, and I know you say, okay, well, repo will will do it or whatever. But now I've got to rebuild everything every time I want to make a change to any little project. That seems like kind of uh, a step Wait, backwards. To me. Why do you have to rebuild everything every time you make a little change? Well, so so you said that uh, repo maintains a DAG of what projects need to be rebuilt. So. No, that's not repo. It assumes that no, 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 repo's not, no, 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 repo's not doing that. That was, that was in Jenkins uh, when you push. Uh, so, for example, say I don't know, uh, segment routing is depending on vRouter. I'm just, oh no, let's not say that. Let's say segment routing is dependent on some component of Onos that's also a module that's also a, a separate repo, and somebody pushes a change to that. And segment routing in Jenkins will be kicked off to be rebuilt against that change. Right? Yeah, but but against which Jenkins patch set is it going to do? No, it'll, it'll it'll the segment routing app will be checked out from where it was at last at from the from its head, not from the patch set. Whatever the change is, the latest build will create that that that, that um, rebuild. I can show you when you get here. It's kind of hard to. Uh, yeah, yeah fair, fair enough. I, I, okay, I mean, um, I guess I, I haven't really looked into repo much. Um, repo I, I am still a bit wary about the, the challenges of, of making these sort of dependent changes. Okay, so all right. So I'm just trying to figure out where. Where to start? Whether because we still have this, we still have you know proliferation of projects, uh, um, which is a good thing, right? That means that there is a lot of interest to work with Onos. There is a lot of enthusiasm and, and desire to, to drive features into Onos. But also at the same time, there is also um, so, so some other concerns, such as for example pollution of the namespace. Um, uh, that, that I'm concerned about, for example, specifically with Nemo, and this is what one of the reasons that prompted the suggestion to to separate it into its own repository because it, it introduces, you know, as it should be able to introduces a number of generic terms, things like you know name, attribute, whatever, uh, or things that are very very uh, generic, and in some cases uh, the plain name of the class itself is actually in conf not in conflict, but uh, it, there is existing names in the model of the of Onos, um, and and that, in my view, could create confusion. Plus, also, it makes navigating and finding the right entities uh, within the same source tree um, could potentially be confusing. So there was uh, there was one additional motivator to to separate at least the projects in incubation area. Um, an incubation stage into their own repository. So I would almost, you know, prefer to let them start separate and then and, and bring them in as needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the counter argument is think. that um, maintaining history can be a little bit difficult. It's not impossible, but it's. Well, anyway. Um, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe. Is it worth trying to, to, to get an, to get a perspective of of somebody who who runs the the build management and and re repo structure of, of some of these bigger projects or bigger companies? And kind of hearing a possibly so yeah perspective of someone I mean we can we can certainly start by letting the you know at least the sort of the catalyst, which is the Nemo Gary review, we can certainly just say, okay, well, we'll just until we work, work things out and we'll make a final decision, we we can just let this check in go and just sort of unblock that, and then while we continue to do some further um, homework to figure out how to, you know, what are all the caveats and uh, all the benefits. 
I mean, doing nothing at this point in time costs us not, no time, right? So leaving things in the same repo will cost us no time. The, the downside is that may potentially grow the size of the repo, but like you said, we have some mitigating. Uh, I think it's not just the size of the repo. It's, for me, it's always this question of external applications, right? So, um, I, I mean, Brian, would you argue that everybody who's running an external application should put it in the honest repo just in case they want to ever change something in the core? It's like we need to solve this problem of, of external applications like being in their own repos depending on the honest core. And if, if it's too hard to do that right now, then we need to kind of work, work towards a solution for that, right? Uh, yeah, but, no, I... I, um, I I sort of see that as an orthogonal problem, um, and I think that's a, a problem, in my opinion, that's best solved by uh, more frequent um, build releases, right. uh, where where people can say, well, you know, if if we can if we can do a better job automating the quote unquote you know master or automating the release uh, process, then being able to kick one off on a every couple weeks basis enables someone. To instead of depending on you know the latest committed master, they're depending on you know something that uh, you know is two or three weeks old. So if if they kind of want to make one level of cascading change, I need a core change here, or I want to depend on this new core feature, I can build my app against this. And then you know they may leave it there, and then they may say, okay, I'll wait until the, the next major release, and then set that as my version number. Um, but no, I, I agree with you completely that if you're going to build code outside of the Onos repo, um, dealing with versioning is is a challenge at this point. Uh, snapshot isn't a great solution, uh, and our major releases are just too far apart. And so we could say that we want to treat all applications that way. You know, we may we may just boot all the applications out of the Onos core repo. Um, they can all have their own separate repos. They can they can work at their own pace. Um, but to solve the, the codependent change problem uh, or cascading change problem, we'll need to have sort of more stable snapshots or more stable artifacts on which people can depend. Yeah. Um, the, Thomas, so the, for the Nemo, for the Nemo I have, uh, so the Nemo now is, uh, is the position is as uh, Compiler is the language uh, compilers for the intent the APIs, right? So the so the based on this, so that in the future more service lo logic could be uh, built into the Onos cores and the applications. So what that means that means the Nemo could have a potential to have a strong dependencies on the multiple services in the Onos. That case, if we move out, it's the same thing. Is my concern is that. Like the brand set is uh, cascaded or something, so depend dependencies. So the so the for time being, I I don't have any strong uh, reason to uh, see the drawbacks for the separate uh, repo. But uh, here's my concerns. I I'm going to talk to the the Nemo teams and give the team the uh, feedback about this ones because they already implement. Uh, this one in the ODRs, so mm -hmm. I want to get their feedback and see hey, what's the real problem they see in the future. The second one is, uh, is uh, do you guys see any problems after we see the multiple repos? If the guys build their controllers to get all these ones, do you think it will cause the 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 builders has any problem? Potent, potential problems, complexities there. They should manage the. Like uh, if I, I want to build my own uh, controllers, right? I have my code, but uh, most of the code is coming from the owners, right? So that if I build this one, I pull from I a different build repo. Build repo, you can get more flexibility, right? You'll be able to say, oh, I don't want this particular provider, I want these ones. So maybe no, maybe, flexibility maybe is the, the change is different. Here, right? like the way we do this is not by, uh, like, like, like the, the way we're talking about this is, we split up ONOS into multiple repositories, and then somehow we pull back ONOS together to then uh, deliver bits, right? And even though these other repositories, uh, these other components are in different repositories, they're still under our ownership. Maybe the idea here is to relinquish ownership uh, of these modules to whoever wants to have it, right? 
and they become responsible for their own release cycle. Uh, I don't think that is a better idea. <laughs> so the, basically the people, I was thinking this, uh, they were in out to uh, the, the, the reduce this the dependencies, they could uh, make their code uh, more dupli replicate code duplication, <laughs> right? That's the event eventually. Well, that's, once that would be a terrible, uh, that, would, that would be a bad side effect if people in, in other projects or if other they're, groups, If they're managing their own, right? So the, basically they will build the some things they like. So they put the, everything so you duplicate this and duplicate that. <laughs> well, that's about it. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess for, for, I mean, clearly external applications, like what John was saying, you know, they're really not under our ownership. People, they're not even, we don't even necessarily have visibility to them, yeah. that they exist. With these things, uh, clearly I, w I was assuming we would be once maintaining uh, ownership and therefore will continue to be on the hook for making sure that these things are built as part of you know, that there's a the necessary infrastructure is in place to be able to do things like area verification, uh, be able to build them, release them, and then potentially even include them in on a star uh, release. I was assuming that was the sort of part so of the is, scope of responsibility. Yeah, there's another way to do this is that uh, the Jenkins verification group. Mm -hmm. Or the Jenkins build actually, um, when it builds on us to verify your your build prop, your your build, it actually reassembles on us from all the repositories. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So as opposed to um, it just reassembles all of on us, builds that, and if that passes, then you change the proof. Yeah. Just, I mean, we definitely want to move the assembly of Ono Star into the Gary validation build, so that Ono also potentially do a lightweight STC test, just basically just sort of small test, just as a. No, I understand. But well, what I'm saying is, uh -huh. is, is around the versioning issue. I don't know if it helps. I, it, it's something to look into because if I, if because right now we'll, we'll say like, like all these projects get verified independently, and then when it comes time to stitch them together, that's when all the yeah. you know the gremlins come up. Okay, so uh, uh, let's do this. Let's okay. Let, let's do this. So starting with Nemo because it's a sizable piece of code uh, that pitches potentially other things with you know it's an incubation area. Let's start in a separate repo with that one. Um, we don't need to necessarily solve the journal problem um, or, or even move the problem to its extreme where all our apps are external mm. uh, until uh, we've done some more thinking about it. But right now. Let's uh, start Nemo on its separate repository. You can set that up fairly quickly, make sure that there is its own. Basically, it'll be treated just like one of the entries are treated right now. Um, and except it will be an app that's in its, you know, it's a corresponding to an incubation a project in its incubation period. Uh, as time goes on, if you decide that it needs to be part of the core, we can always bring it in, uh, including all of its check in history and everything else. Um, <clears throat> and then we can continue the discussion more on general uh, scale. And also we can perhaps use this as an experiment to learn uh, about this, right? Because the I think with the Onos Yang tools, it being a utility and sort of a separate thing that doesn't necessarily run in line, uh, it's fairly clear, as, as Brian articulated. With, with, with Nemo being an Onos app, it's sort of our first experiment of sort of splitting the repo. Let's use that as a learning um, uh, experience, and then from there we can decide whether we want to uh, also in, in bring the ACT and V router and segment routing into the same picture. So, does it sound reasonable? Yes. Any, any objections, Brian? Uh, that's fine. Okay, and we can continue the discussion uh, probably on the mailing list to make sure that everybody um, has a chance to chime in and listening. All right. I think we are running to our hour and a half mark here. So uh, unless there's any other um, topics or concerns, we can close the meeting. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.